Okay, we're live. Amazing. Okay. We did it. Woo! Can you hear me? Can you see me? Everything okay? I, I can hear and see you. Awesome, awesome. How are you today, Alex? Having a good day? It's good. It's Thursday, Friday Eve. I can't complain. I <laughs> love it. Yeah, it's a nice sunny day in the UK. So that's that's something. It's not raining for a first. <laughs> Always a plus. Always a plus. All right, let's kick off. So welcome everyone to the Keys to Aid Overs Optimization, the show where we're going to share stories, concepts, solutions that can help you unlock optimization at AWS. I am your host, Stephanie Gooch, and today with me is my co-host, Alex Head. Woo. Hello. Alex. This is our first show. So we're super excited to be here. Hopefully some of you are going to start joining. And throughout this whole thing, we want you guys to ask us questions, to provide comments, tell us what you're doing. And super important, we really want to hear from you. So we're going to be doing something called the saving shout out. So every week, regardless of what we are talking about, we want to hear from you. We want to hear your success stories. We want to give you a platform to share those things. So if you throw them in a the chat, mark them SSO, or just put them as saving shout out, and we'll find them either in the middle or at the end of the show, and we'll do a shout out to you. So twofold reasons. It's first of all, great for you to kind of share that, that you've done that, get some praise, but also you might inspire another customer. So share that story, build that community, and let us know what you're doing. So throughout this show, we're going to have a couple of different focus areas, but the main bulk of it is going to be cloud financial management, cost optimization. But the three main things are going to be customer stories. So we're going to get some special guests in and they're going to share things that they've done with customers, actual stories that have shown ways they've saved money. We're also going to do some resource review. So blogs, guides, uh, labs, we're going to have people coming in and sharing those. And we're going to discuss the nuances around those topics. And then super important for cost optimization, deep dives into utilization of Amazon services, kind of what we would do in a situation where we want to save money on those services. So if you want to hear from, if you want to talk to us outside of this channel, we're here every Thursday at three o'clock uh, British summertime, uh, and then your retrospective time zones. But you can find us on Twitter. I am at Lift Like a Nerd, which we'll probably cover at some point, but you can see my background. There's some, some nerdy bits going on there already. And Alex is a underscore head of tweets. So today we are going to be just chatting the two of us. We're going to be some of your regular hosts, but there are going to be some other people kind of joining us. So we thought we kind of introduce ourselves and talk about some of the things that we've been doing at AWS. So Alex, why don't you, why don't you go first and uh, tell us how you ended up in the world of optimization? Yes. Yeah, so I'm the less cooler non-British host today. Um, but my name is Alex. I work with Steph. Um, and I actually got to work with Steph a little bit before she joined the team tool. So I get a uh, double perspective on her. Uh, I work at AWS, obviously, and I've been there almost four years, uh, starting out as a commercial architect. And now I got I get to lead this awesome optimization team. Um, I found my way into optimization and in kind of a nuanced way when I used to work at the Weather Channel. Um, and we were doing a huge migration out of data centers and I was actually on the procurement side and looking at the bills and could not figure out AWS bills for the life of me. So I bought AWS for dummies and which I still have right there uh, next to my <laughs> desk. <laughs> it's my, um, my reminder that I can learn things and uh, started dissecting the bills and looking for efficiencies and trends and um, first got a little bit of background on what optimization would be and how I could tell if these different teams were being efficient at, during this massive migration. Awesome, awesome. So you seem to have really like evolved your skills over the, that time. Um, how is it kind of transitioned into working at Amazon? Yeah, so AWS uh, had a huge relationship um, there while we did the migration. So I got to know the team really well. And then IBM bought us, uh, bought Weather Channel. And mm -hmm. I started working with acquisitions at IBM that would come in and have a cloud footprint. And I would go and look and see if they were being efficient or if they were um, doing something unique or anything like that. And I spent more time at the AWS office than I did at my own. Um, <laughs> 
and uh, eventually decided to join the dark side. No, I'm kidding. Not the dark side, the good side. And I got hired to work with some of the largest global customers. So at the time, there was like, um, they had like kind of handpicked, I guess, 30, 40 uh, customers. And I gave them that white glove cost optimization mm -hmm. treatment. And so at the start, it was probably a lot more finance focused. And then being at AWS and all the amazing resources that they have, um, I loved the challenge of learning more on that technical side. And so I got to dive more into that and see the unique situations these customers were having. And so uh, just, you know, building those relationships, it's earning trust with those customers and uh, trying to be creative when it comes to explaining a lot, a lot, a lot of numbers. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So is there any advice that you would give to people starting out who maybe are new to this show and want to learn a bit about how to get started in the world of cost optimization? Yes, anyone can do it, truly. <laughs> um, I think when I started my first job that had the word cloud in it, I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> um, this, is, this is way over my head and I'm an animal science major. And, uh, but cloud changes so much that there truly is no expert that knows every single thing going on. AWS releases new things constantly. So it gives you the opportunity to have um, that constant learning and, and it creates an environment where there's all these different types of materials, uh, mm -hmm. some which Steph has created uh, <laughs> to, to learn from. And so I guess don't ever be intimidated by the word lab. Um, Great and, <laughs> and don't be intimidated by different fancy words for data. Um, you know, they're all really just looking at numbers and making sense of them. And if you enjoy that, you can you can figure your way out yeah. in this world. Uh, and I see a comment from Rob. Yes, animal science does come in handy when dealing with these teams. You know, <laughs> I used to work with cows and horses. So, you know, <laughs> just like for like cattle, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. So from then when you first started, and then all the way till now, do you think there's a, a bit of a difference in the way that customers approach cost optimization from all those years, all those years ago, from those years ago to now? <laughs> Thanks. Not that old. No. <laughs> not that old. Yes. Not that old. Yes. <laughs> yes. And um, I think that's the best part about optimization and why we can have something like this, a weekly show to talk about it. Because uh, yeah. I would argue, I mean, I think, Steph, you joined the team in September. Yeah, I think. I think. We, we like pseudo worked together for longer than that so but i think you officially became aws in september and what we would have talked about in september is completely different than what we're talking about now and so watching those trends change um and i think the key is letting our customers teach us some of those trends right challenge us um i always like to start an optimization conversation that's a mouthful uh with you know where have you looked into opportunities uh we talk a lot about setting metrics to watch your progress, right, and your efficiencies. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that there's a great blog post out right now um, on those metrics and how they bring together functions. Uh, but I always like to challenge the customer or whoever I'm working with of, you know, give me a new metric. Like, what have you looked into? What do you want to um, dive into and, and see if we can get creative? I think right now the hot topics are definitely modernization when it comes to Graviton and AMD and EBS, um, but it might change tomorrow. You never know. <laughs> you never know. Awesome, awesome. So your job and, and the job of our team as well is to is to go in and tell customers, we're going to come in and save you money. How mm -hmm. do they react to that as a concept? Because that's strange for a business to kind of come in and say, yeah, I know you're buying stuff from us, but we want to give you a discount and we want to help you save things and we want to cut your costs. So how are they reacting to that? Yeah, I would say a lot of a lot of times skeptical at first, um, <laughs> but it's a great way to build that relationship, right? I um, am rewarded in the eyes of my peers by how much more efficient I can make a customer, and they are gonna, you know, they are rewarded in the eyes of their leadership or their company mm -hmm. and how much more efficient they can get. So it's a big common interest and we really get to come in and save the day a bit. Uh, but it's also picked up a lot of traction, right? So it was just me. Um, and 
uh, you know, for a long time. And we had people in the original global accounts that was, um, I think we had two originally commercial architects. Uh, but now, you know, you tell so many large customers that are growing on AWS that we're, our sole job is to save you money and it picks up traction. So it really makes you think about, okay, how can I teach and scale um, and grow my impact without necessarily being able to be in front of hundreds of customers at one, you know, mm -hmm. one off meetings. Mm -hmm. So how did you transition into the optics team, which is which is our team? Right. So then it obviously picked up a lot of traction for saving customers money and the org within AWS that I work in um, grew and grew and more customers got added and yeah. uh, it really wasn't uh, I wasn't set up for success if I did it by myself anymore mm -hmm. um, also I think one of the reasons that you know we have multiple team members that are going to be joining this twitch and that you and I are doing this is mm -hmm. we all work better collaborating right so I might know 100% the answer to a customer's question about cleaning up their EBS or cleaning up snapshots but I mention it to Steph and say, you know, I'm talking through this with a customer and she says, oh wait, I've worked with a template that I've made so that they can automatically do it and do checks here and there, things that I wouldn't have thought about. So it, we realized that the impact grew if we had more knowledge bases and different knowledge bases, right? We don't want everyone to have the same background. Um, and so I got the great opportunity to build out optics, which for those who, don't know what that means, which we probably should have started <laughs> with. Um, it's optimization intelligence for cloud systems. And I got to hire great people like Steph to be on my team. Um, and I'm excited to kind of turn the tables here and ask Steph how she got into optimization. I know how she found her way onto my team um, <laughs> through lots of begging and pleading. No, I'm kidding. But uh, how did you get into the world of optimization? Great question. I mean, I love talking about myself, so it's great. <laughs> and for those of you who have just joined us maybe midway, we are two of your hosts for the keys of the keys to AWS optimization. And we're just talking a bit about how we've gotten into optimization and uh, sharing some background stories. So I actually worked at KPMG UK before I came to AWS and I was a DevOps engineer. So a normal DevOps engineer, building out infrastructure as code, building Python scripts, kind of all your standard stuff. And then I was actually doing a dissertation on cost optimization because I thought it was interesting. I hadn't seen many people doing it at the time and then found it was like an area that I really liked and that there was a bit of a niche at my company. And so I just started to build out some tools to help me do the work for my dissertation. And then I went in and said, we, haven't, we don't have a team that does this. Can I make a team that does this? And then lo and behold, created the FinOps team at KPMG. And then we ran the kind of management, financial management for the three main providers. So KP, um, AWS, GCP and Azure. And I shouldn't say those other names on here probably. And uh, and then it just kind of grew from there. So my main job was things like uh, chargeback reporting, but I was coming from a DevOps engineer space. So rather than just kind of running Excel sheets manually, I started to be like, okay, how can I automate this? How can I take the DevOps knowledge that I have and turn it into FinOps knowledge? So you started automating solutions, building stuff out in Terraform, and uh, kind of creating more of a automated culture with the financial management. So that's kind of where I, I came from previously. So did you have a hard time seeing that you kind of created this idea in your org at, at KPMG? Did you have a hard time explaining it to people or kind of taking away those barriers of maybe someone in DevOps being too worried about the finance side of it and like someone in finance being too worried about like, am I technical enough for this? hundred percent. It was interesting because at KPMG, well, I, I can say this, but at KPMG at the time, some people didn't really mind about the cost because the cost was kind of being thrown over to other people. And so, the, and the engineers weren't measured on the cost optimization. They weren't, no one was looking at the data. And, and that's a big thing. I don't think we even had the curse set up when I first started looking into it. So no one was really tracking what was going on. And so it took a lot for people to start to actually care. And it took a lot of me kind of like knocking on the door and being like, oh, you should you should look at this, like you should see this um, and sharing visuals and dashboards. But a lot of it 
for me that worked really well was when I started to ask them what they wanted rather than me just assume that I knew what to tell people what they should hear. So I started to kind of ask questions and say, well, what's going to make your life easier? What do your customers want? What reports are going to be easy for you to digest? And then start to kind of build that into the solution. And then with the finance people, it was more like, how can I make their job easier than the technical side of it? Because they just, uh, things like RIs and savings plans, I think is a classic uh, not issue, but the kind of discussion points that happened mm -hmm. with finance. And they needed some support on being like, they just see a line item and expense. They don't know that the way it works. And so taking some time, doing some education with them, then they can have full on conversation with me about where we're using savings plans, where we're using our eyes and doing that. And that was great. A great like win when we were doing it was having those conversations. Yeah. So say I am, you know, you mentioned things in there like the cur and dashboarding and reporting. So say that I am working for a company that has like a, a has a footprint on AWS and I want to dig into that cost and usage a little bit more. What would you say is like the absolute bare minimum kind of first steps you would do? And I'm guessing it would it would be around the cur. Um, <laughs> And I also should emphasize that we didn't prep these questions because we wanted it to be natural. So uh, poor Steph, I'm throwing anything at her right now. <laughs> um, so cut her some flag. But uh, what would be kind of those top like three things or whatever that you would say, you know, make sure this is set up, make sure you have this permission or something like that. So uh, I'll also pass this out to anybody watching. Tell us what you think, what would be your three main steps? That would be really great to hear. Uh, all this is stuff. So yes, definitely number one, set the care up. The care is not very expensive to have. It's super easy to set up and it gives you that wealth of data as soon as you get going. Uh, I think number two, I'm going to plug my own lab, which is the uh, organization lab. So the organization lab and the well-architected labs, we can link to these in the show notes at the end uh, or in the chat, but the lab allows you to pull data from your AWS organization, uh, such as tags, names, uh, statuses, and put those into the CUR. And this was something that was very similar to what I did at KPMG, where we really struggled with having this CUR data and then the, all the invoice data that was actually used by finance. And then they had a manual Excel sheet that some poor person had to update. And there was people making accounts left, right, and center and not telling this woman. And it was like a whole nightmare. And then we'd have a grand like missing. So having an automated way of getting some more metadata into your accounts is a really good place to kind of start. And then I think uh, starting to just play with it. So getting your Athena set up so that you can start querying it. There's a, another great lab, which is the Curve Query Library that if you're not a SQL pro and you want to get started with it, that's a good place to look. Um, and so you can start just messing around and, uh, and start seeing what's going on and there's no wrong thing to do with it the presto library online is really helpful the curl library is really helpful um so it's really good and some people uh, matt and rob in the chat have just pasted some links so if anybody watching wants to to find out more about those labs that's where i'd start but a massive plug for those and also next week we're going to have the owner of the well architected labs come and chat to us so we'll be hearing much more about them but yeah i think getting used to the cur and uh kind of understanding how it's made up. It is a bit of a minefield, but kind of getting started with that was the way that really kind of got me going. Yeah, and also emphasize that if you are, are listening and have ideas for future labs that you would like to see, we'd love oh. to hear that too. Um, um, well, Alex, why don't you tell us what you think your oh, top three things, it. just throwing it back at you. Well, so since you went a lot more on the, you know, the data side, I would say if I, you know, don't have much of a data background, mm -hmm. I'm new, maybe I'm like an intern or, you know, brand new. Um, my first thing would be learn your cut your account structure, right? So do you have a payer account and linked accounts? Like how are your accounts structured and using organizations? Um, and the best way to do this is really go talk to some of those, uh, those development teams and application teams and say, mm -hmm. you know, when you make something, Let's yeah. really make it simple here on AWS. Like what, can you show me what you do? Can I just stand behind you for a minute? Um, and understanding their process. And then yeah. the first and like quick way to look at cost is going to be, you know, cost Explorer and seeing trends. And one of my favorite things about cost Explorer is it has, as soon as you log onto it, it has the anomalies on the, on the side. So like what has changed and start clicking around and see if you can track, mm -hmm. you know, what, 
what has changed and why has it changed, what accounts are driving it. Um, and make sure you ask these different application teams too, of like, do you have any documentation that I can read? Uh, do you, you know, how do you know if this is a production thing or a non-production thing? And just understanding their mindset on it because that will help you when you really dig into that cost and usage and find optimization patterns, that will really help you understand what you can suggest that they can actually take into place. That yeah. and, and also, you know, I don't think it's it's efficient to come in and say, hey, fix all of this. But if you're learning what they're doing and understanding the nuances, then you're going to get a lot more more traction with them and earning trust with those teams uh, and mm -hmm. probably have more optimization um, success from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. Also, there's so many resources, you know, like the <laughs> thin ops, um, which Steph should go into her her role there. Yeah. And uh, AWS cost blogs, you can go on, you can even press play and have Polly read them to you in the background while you go to, on a walk. Uh, you know, things like A Cloud Guru. There's so many resources that even just listening to them, or you can listen to us talk every Thursday yeah. at <laughs> <Sure>. this time. <laughs> and, you know, understanding some of the buzzwords and what people are talking about and, and bringing that to your teams. This is all a collaborative effort it can't mm -hmm. never be one person optimizes. Uh, it always has to be, you know, how do we communicate? How do we bring those together? We always say on our team that we're connecting the dots for IT, finance, and business. So keeping that in mind while you learn too, it's always going to help you. So I did mention in there the FinOps Foundation a little bit. Steph, do you mm -hmm. want to go yeah. into how you got involved there? Yeah, sure. I, I'm trying to remember. I got involved with the FinOps Foundation like a near when it was like 30 people on a, a bi-weekly call, I feel like just really early days. Um, and it was, I think I just found it because I went to an event that was like next to the London summit. It was like a pre-day cloudability were hosting an event and I and everyone was talking about cost. And I have a vague memory of talking to cloudability, I think, and they were saying about how they could use their tool. And I was like, oh, I can do that stuff. You get the care. And they were like, yeah, but we've got all this other stuff. And I was like, yeah, but you can just get the care. Like, that's the place to start, right? And they were like, oh, okay, this girl kind of knows what she's talking about. And then I started to just make some contacts in that area and then kind of befriend that lot. And it's a really great um, community. It sounds cheesy because I keep saying the word like community and lots of people, but there is a Slack channel that you can join and uh, it's just a wealth of information. And you can just ask a question and someone's going to be there to kind of who's done it before, who can share their experience. And I really recommend seeking them out, kind of looking into it. They are really, really good. And uh, there's also London meetups and then there's international meetups of the FinOps Foundation. And as well as that, there's also the AWS user group meetups, which have stuff like this sometimes. So linked in the AWS uh, Twitch page, I believe, there's a link to where you can join your local meetup. And I really recommend kind of having a look at that. Yeah. And one of the, at least for me, one of the things that's been great about this virtual world that we've all lived in the past year is that you can join these things and become members and be virtual. Uh, so you know, sometimes making that big commitment to go and stand in a room with a bunch of strangers and, you know, network and have side chit chat can be a little overwhelming. Uh, but so many of these like Steph did a meetup a month ago that was all virtual. So people could kind of ask questions and got to be in the comfort of their home. And so now is the time to at least dabble in these things a little bit, right? Because it's it's not, I mean, you can sit on your couch, um, have a glass of wine and listen in, right? So, or your tea. And it kind of <laughs> helps that barrier of entry of why not? Why not just listen yeah. in and, and see if you learn anything? Yeah, that's definitely the way I got involved. And then kind of the more you do it, the more, and then you might want to share your stories. You might get inspired to do things. There's lots. I just pasted up the, the membership that Rob shared so you can have a look on that. Really recommend it. So we're, uh, we've got about five, six minutes left. Um, while we're chatting, I might as well ask, Alex, what kind of uh, trends are you seeing at the moment? Is there anything exciting in the world of cost optimization that you're thinking these guys should know about? Yeah, so this one we should, I should have prepped, right? Um, <laughs> I don't need to take my one. <laughs> I've thought of an answer for already. <laughs> no, I would say, uh, a trend that I'm seeing is, so a lot of the customers that Steph and I work with, 
we can't necessarily just look at their straight cost and say, mm-hmm. oh, we optimized so it dropped 20%. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's been a lot more focus on efficiency and how we track efficiency, like what unit costs we can look at and getting granular that way. Um, and honestly, any unit cost and trends are, are something that is like both IT will speak, finance will speak, and the business will speak. Mm -hmm. So it really does help trend that and set benchmarks that way. Uh, Also the cool thing, so say you're looking at your EC2 unit cost. So in that I would take like all the hours of EC2 that you are um, running and then Mm -hmm. how much that costs. So like how much is an hour of EC2 and has Mm -hmm. it been more efficient or less efficient? If you start replacing some of your non-prod or your auto scaling with spot instances, you're immediately going to see that dip. And so it is cool because you get to see those um, efficiency changes in real time. Uh, And I just have seen a lot more conversation around people starting that optimization journey and saying, you know, before we start this, Mm -hmm. what KPIs can we look at? Like, how can we track our progress? Uh, So then, you know, everyone's happy, right? You get to go tell your leadership, you became this much more efficient. And even if you're growing overall on your footprint, you can always calculate, all right, if I had stayed at this unit cost for EC2, what would it have cost me uh, versus what it's costing me now? Mm -hmm. We'll share the blog. Alex, do you want to get that? And I'll- um, Yes, I have it right. Here. I think, and to cover that, I think as well, Alex, correct me if I'm wrong. The other things that could help your unit cost are things like scheduling, elasticity, right sizing, all that kind of stuff are, are all going to play a part in that. So, great things to take advantage of. Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, da, da, da. Let me copy that. So, let's post it in the chat. So, I also, we- while you're while you're pasting that in, would say that there is. Um, and maybe it is because we there's become so many virtual learning tools mm-hmm. uh, in the past year, but there is a definite increase in people asking for those that learning opportunity. Uh, yeah. And we've done some awesome virtual events to do that, and you know, virtual hackathons and fin hacks, and uh, being able to really make it unique to the customer and the team because. Mm-hmm. There are certain optimization efforts that can help everyone, but each environment is unique and each you know, plan is unique and how they're going to grow and, and how they report back on that. Yeah. Awesome. I'm trying to think. I think mine is like a cheesy one, which I've written about in my blog uh, and blog post, which is the, the new GP3 uh, available volumes, which I love talking about because it's super easy to, to save on it. And I think that people are now kind of looking at their storage. And that's why it's like a new thing for people to be looking at. So before people are often like, I'm just going to use GP2 and, or I'm just going to choose I1. And they're not really thinking about the maths behind it. They're just kind of, I mean, when I was a developer, uh, to be honest, I, when I started as a developer, I started uh, coming from a grad, uh, a graduate role who didn't have any cloud training, I did maths. So a little bit closer than animal science, maybe from Alex <laughs> into the cloud. But uh, I wasn't uh, in a place where I knew exactly what everything was that I was deploying. People were kind of talk, telling me what to do and then I just kind of deployed it. And then people were just always doing the same thing. So the modules we had created for our Terraform modules or our cloud formation templates, they just had, oh no, that's Alex calling me on a different chat. Um, they, uh, they just kind of were deployed. And I wasn't really thinking about why did I choose that one? Why am I choosing GP2? Why am I not choosing I1 or the other way around? And I think this new GP3, because it's kind of thrown something in there and people are like, oh, wait, what am I, what am I doing it? Um, how, do I, how do I change? And maybe I should think about which one I'm using and why I'm using it and kind of having those conversations is a really great thing. So yes, it's a great saving, but it's also making people more aware. So I also don't know if I said the saving. So GP2, uh, are, so GP3 are 20% cheaper than GP3 when it comes to kind of flat, less than 3,000 IOPS. Um, a high pitch buzzing. People were hearing a high pitch buzzing. I don't know. Alex, can you hear a high pitch buzzing? That's... I don't. I don't think it's everyone. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to go uh, on and off mute. Uh, so we're at time. We've got one question. How would you recommend transitioning a legacy customer deployed and managed into infrastructure as cloud? Oh, I would to uh, to quickly cover that for Arthur Man. I'll show that question up there. Um, 
interesting question for a cost optimization one, but I do like it because infrastructure as code is very important when it comes to optimizing and being aware of your costs. So I would utilize for Terraform, uh, for infrastructure as code, generally Terraform has a good way of reading your account and then transitioning it. If you have a TAM, uh, a technical account manager, potentially utilize them. Um, but it's also, oh, now Steph is muted. I'm a bit concerned about this person's access. Am I muted? <laughs> no. We can hear you. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, in summary, how would you transition? Uh, I would look at the estate. I would use, there are some tools that can analyze your account and then transition them into like a CloudFormation template and they're on GitHub and things like that. So that's how I'd start doing it. Uh, but uh, I'd highly recommend checking out some of the other channels on this Twitch channel uh, to ask that question, Arthur Man, because uh, uh, we're more focused around costs. And it's been a while since I've had to do a migration, especially to CloudFormation. Uh, we have just run over, but luckily no one's behind us today, so that's fine. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I hope that we've shed some light on some little bits of cost optimization, some background for us. As I said, next week, we will be having a guest, uh, Ali, who's in our team, who manages the uh, well-architected labs to come on and talk a bit about the new labs, the new development, there's some cool new things going on with them. We're bringing in a bit more of code side, which obviously I'm really excited about. And uh, yeah, any closing statements, Alex? Nope, I hope everybody has a good rest of the week. And if there's anything specific you wanna hear from us, just let us know. Yeah, brilliant. Don't forget to check us out on Twitch or find us on LinkedIn. Anyway, have a good day. Thanks for joining us. See ya.